Are you ready to go back? Matthew, as we left off or partially started. Matthew chapter 4. I want to help you become an overcomer today. No matter what's going on. I said something Friday night that if I did not have God's word tucked away in my heart deeply, I would be dead today. And I have to tell you, dead men are just happy to be alive. I saw my cardiologist this past week. He just shakes his head at me because I'm not supposed to be doing good. I love his words, see in six months. I'm glad I don't get to visit God once every six months. Matthew chapter 4. Let's go there and I want you to read along with me or on the screen or wherever you have it. And this begins the journey of Jesus. This is after Jesus was baptized in water by John, was baptized in the Holy Spirit by the Father, and he was about to begin his ministry. But I have to tell you something, and I had this thought this morning. The church doesn't want to prepare for war. So when the enemy comes, it doesn't know what to do with it. There is not a, there is not a government on this planet that does not do mock drills of warfare in case they need to go to war, except the church. It's the only, it is the only government in the earth that spends very little time doing mock drills against the enemy. How are we going to defeat the enemy? That would make a great, that would make a great conference. Preparing to defeat the enemy in all the areas that we're going to plan on defeating him. But most people are overcome by the enemy, and then they look for help. There is a place that we can come to that we don't need to always be looking for somebody to pray for us or God to heal us or deliver us. There's a place in Scripture that says you can live a life here and not be overcome by the enemy. But there are rules of the road. In the, in the Old Testament, if you want to go back there and read, people don't read it anymore, but they should. There's a scripture that indicates that if you'll be a doer of the word, God will not allow any of the evil diseases of Egypt to come upon you. That is in your Bibles. So right there, diseases are called evil. And they're from Egypt. And Egypt is a type and a standard of what? The world. And all your medicines come from Egypt. And the Egyptian way of dealing with things. Now, with that said, relax. Verse 1, chapter 4 of Matthew. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit in the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Wait a minute. I bet you're not going to admit that well, I was being led by the Spirit of God today to be tempted of the devil. It probably the best thing ever happened to you. Because you'd then learn how to defeat him, how to be an overcomer. If you don't have any experience and don't have any practice in understanding what temptation means, and what is of God and what is not of God, if you don't have any experience in using your sword, not your rubber duck, if you don't have any experience in overcoming, if you don't have any experience in resisting temptation, if you don't have any experience in warfare, you're easy pickings. See you later. Bye. Throw you a curveball. You're out of here. The church sometimes acts like a little child always looking for a parent to defend it when it should have been raised to defend itself as an adult. Unless you want to go look for your mommies and daddies. Now, come on now. When I was a child, I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away what? Childish things. Jesus was led by an evil spirit. 
He was led by the Holy Spirit. Jesus was about to encounter some resistance by the organized church. Jesus got no resistance from the unsaved Gentile. None. The only resistance he got was from God's people. Because he represented something that they said they didn't need. Because they were set in their ways of religion and apostasy. And, and all Jesus did was come along and ask them to change into the image of the Father and embrace the kingdom of the Father. And they wanted nothing to do with it, but they were God's people. Really? I'll tell you what Jesus said about them being God's people. He said, your father's the devil. So much of being God's people. He said that to the leaders of the Old Testament church. Boy, he was a brave guy. A lot of times people think Jesus is a little syrupy, effeminate, a syrupy little guy that just looks at you with eyes of love and just dreams and oozes all over you. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, and he is one of them. Judgment seat of Christ. He's no wimp, folks. Love doesn't have to be wimpy. Well, if you loved me, you'd put up with my stuff. Well, if you love God, you wouldn't have any stuff. Say, hey, Pastor, you need to calm down. Why would I want to calm down? The day I calm down, you're in trouble. Because I'm a warrior. And I'm looking for people who want to go to war. They're called overcomers. There are people that really want to embrace and be the seed of life in the earth, no matter what anybody else is doing. Is there any other gospel to teach? Should we mix all the world religions into Christianity so we can get along with them? I'm absolutely shocked at the bewitchment and the hypnosis of leaders in the industrialized world, including America, who have this thought being mesmerized and bewitched and hip hypnotized that nations who don't get along with each other already will get along when they get here. These are people of the same faith killing each other. Islamic faith, they're killing each other because Islam is split into two camps of division. And I hate each other. Muhammad would roll over in his grave. Don't ask him to come out. He can't. And we believe that those people who can't get along with each other in their own lands somehow will love each other and us when they get here. Are you serious? Well, we just need to love the enemy. What, who is an enemy? Right now, America is an enemy of God because not embracing the principles of the kingdom. There are, no, there are no elders representing God in our nation any longer. I haven't found one acting as an apostle or a prophet over our nation in a very long time. That's not my subject. My subject is even what's happening today is trying your faith. It's a form of temptation to see whether you'll compromise. You see, what Satan, and I'm going to read this here, what's, I may not get this done today. Lord have mercy. Maybe I'll finish it Friday or next Sunday. I don't know when I'll finish it. But what Satan was asking Jesus to do, I'm going to read it was compromise, mix, be rebellious. Let's read. Then Jesus was, was Jesus led up of the Spirit in the wilderness to be tempted of the devil, and when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, ah, 40 days and 40 nights with no food, and Jesus was hungry. You'd be hungry too. Was that hunger a form of temptation? Not necessarily, but Satan will use your weakness to tempt you. And he knows your weaknesses. 
He knows your iniquity and your generations and their weaknesses. And your enemy has been skillful in controlling your ancestry all the way back to Adam. Because all of you are from Adam. All of you are from Noah. And that kingdom has been skillful in controlling even God's people. And if the enemy can't defeat you, he'll become part of you. To leaven you with his mind, his way of thinking. To get you to conform to his image of thought and speech and action. You go, I'm not going to read down through here because I want to save some time that, as if that were important to me. But it says, verse 3, And when the tempter came to him, If thou be the Son of God, here comes the challenge. If thou be the Son of God, command these stones be made to bread. And Jesus answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And you know the story and how that Jesus defeated the enemy, how? With the word. The only way that you're going to defeat temptation is with the word, not as a flashcard. I see so many people having scriptural flashcards in their wallets. Ah! Got to find the right flashcard. Here, here, devil, look, read this. No, no, it's not your flashcard. It's who you are in the word. When the enemy comes, he just doesn't have the word to deal with. He has Henry in the word to deal with here on the earth. And that word don't work in the earth unless Henry shows up with the word in his mouth and resists the devil. It's happening right here. I'm on duty. So quit asking Jesus to come from heaven and do your work for you. Jesus, come here. I got a bully. I got a bully talking in my head. You know what Paul taught about the bully talking to you in your head? There is so much information in your Bible. If you would read it, you'd have the tools, not the superstition. I, I give you what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 7 1. I give you the tools that when the thing comes in your head, say, Jesus, stop making the enemy talk to me. Make him stop these thoughts in my head. And you said, I'm going to tell Jesus on you. That ain't going to work either. That ain't going to work a bit. You know, when Jesus, when the enemy came to Jesus, Jesus didn't sick the father on him. He said, I'm going to tell my daddy on you. I'm a son of God, remember? Look at me, son of God. Look here. No, 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 no. He took the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and he simply said, for it is written. Folks, this is a horrible thought. What if Jesus didn't know the Word? He said, but he was the Word. Uh-uh. He was the Word that came into flesh. But what if I suggested that he had to Read that word for himself as Jesus of Nazareth from childhood. What have I suggested to you that who he was, he understood who he was from the prophets as a man. He even had to have his diapers changed as a baby. God needed his diapers changed? No, Jesus the child did. Jesus was debating the word with the religious leaders at the temple in Jerusalem at age 12. For him to debate with the esteemed experts in the law, he would have had to read the Torah, the writings, and the prophets himself. See, what, what Satan was quoting, and here comes the next problem you have. 
in this warfare. Your enemy in his kingdom know the word better than you. And they know exactly what words you don't know. And they know what words you're disobeying. Because they taught you to disobey it. So when Satan came here in Matthew, and he began to tempt Jesus, he tempted Jesus with the word out of Deuteronomy and out of Psalms, which means Satan would have had to have read Deuteronomy and Psalms to be able to tempt Jesus with the word to begin with, because Satan is not omniscient. He knows Deuteronomy. He knows Psalms. Do you know Deuteronomy? And do you know Psalms? I think there comes a place in this resisting temptation that we need to know the word better than Satan and devils. I was uh, being challenged on the overcomers um, group that we supporting by someone on the forum that was taking issue with my statement that I would, I wasn't really thrilled to be known as a Christian, but I was extremely thrilled to be known as a believer. And I got challenged because it was suggested that I was being disrespectful to Christians. So then I had to think, well, am I being disrespectful to believers too? And what they threw at me, I felt just like, I felt like, just, I felt like right here, right now, they said, well, why is believing so important, Pastor? The Bible says even the devils believe and they tremble. So believing is no big deal, is it? Being a Christian is. I'm right here. Don't ask me to be a believer, but just let me be a Christian. How are you answer that one? Because the devils believe, why is it then the devils have more sense than Christians? At least they tremble. We don't even tremble. It's a sad day when devils have more sense than Christians. Forget about believers. I'm, I'm just challenging you in your thinking. So when the thoughts begin to come, I want to help you. That's why I'm here. You know what I'm talking about? Because I want you to have the same ability to overcome when you're tempted that Jesus had. Because, and I, I don't have time to, because I'm looking at the clock back here, I'm out of time. I'll finish it later. I don't want to. Man, what should I do, Pastor Donna? Do what's in my heart. Oh, it's burning, this is burning really deep in my heart because I have to tell you what I'm hearing in my spirit. Your Father in heaven is, on, is, is sad because you're losing a battle that's already been won. And the tools to win it have already been said. But we're spleeny. We're wusses. We don't like resistance. We just want to live a peaceable life of zombie thinking. Just let us vegetate. Have our veggie tail. We're not up to overcoming. We're not up to resisting. In fact, we're going to go into denial that there's even an enemy. And we're going to remove the fact that there's a kingdom of devils that answers to that enemy. And we're just going to agree with psychologists that this is just my personal negative emotion and psychological defect. And I'm really the problem. I need to shrink. Shrunken heads don't think good. That's a good one. Look at shrunken heads coming out of the cultures down in South America. They not only don't think good, they're ugly. Dead, they're called deadheads. I don't need some advice from a deadhead. All right, I want to move through this. So we see that the Spirit of God took Jesus right to the war. You cannot make a decision for God and not expect the enemy to come immediately to resist you. Somebody said the other day, they'd just become born again, 
They said, I'm doing pretty good until I got born again. Now, I've never had so many problems in all my life. You just met the kingdom that doesn't want it to be defeated. But the people that said, well, I, I didn't have any problems until I became a Christian. I want to tell you the things that were within you that became those problems would have been your problems if you never got born again at all. They just came sooner. Because the enemy kicked it up a notch to discourage you. Besides, why would you want to take advice from a loser anyway? Why would you be concerned what a losing kingdom would have to say to you anyway? You ought to tell the enemy to hell with it. If you're going to use that word that way, that's how you use it. To hell with it. Go. That's your place. Get out of here. Don't listen to that deadhead thinking. See, I didn't finish this in 2 Corinthians 7 1. Paul began to give you the tools. He said, You're to hold every thought captive. Hold every what? Hold what? Do you think? Things come into the belfry tower, sometimes like ticker tape. You just kind of go. You're to take every thought captive. Is that an action verb? Action verb means what? Take action. Hold every thought captive. Casting down every imagination. Is that an action verb? Action required. Action what? Holding every thought captive. Action number one. Action number two? Casting down the thought. Casting down the thought. And every high and lofty thing that would exalt itself against the knowledge of God. Right here, we had Jesus doing something. What was he doing? Holding the voice of Satan captive that created the thought. Casting it down. And every high and lofty thing that would exalt itself against the knowledge of God. So how did Jesus defeat the other mindset? By knowing the true mindset. Because all Jesus did where Satan would come and quote those verses out of, out of context. And as he did in the, in the Garden of Eden, he took what God said and then he added to, took away and changed it. He did the same thing with Jesus. He came and took Scripture in Deuteronomy and Psalms, and he modified it. He modified it. The Jesus who knew the Word in Deuteronomy and Psalms came back and said, well, yeah, but this is what it says. And then Jesus used something that is so powerful in your arsenal of weaponry. He said, for it is written. For it is is written. So when you're tempted to go after a spare rib, you tell that thought, for it is written, thou shalt not commit adultery. Isn't that easy? That was so easy, wasn't it? Or when you're tempted to be angry without a cause, and the enemy comes with thoughts to make you lose it. And the distance between your brain and your tongue is zero. And you go into temporary insanity. And you say things that you'll deny you said later. Because you don't remember saying them because you weren't there. And as you're grasp gasping for air in this moment of shaking between heaven and hell, you rise up in that temptation. You say, for it is written anger. Be angry and sin not. Wasn't that easy? It's easy. Then comes a journey of being a doer of it. It's not easy to follow the correct thought. Then how come is it so easy to follow the incorrect thought? Hmm. Hmm. I got this thought. The Bible says this thought. Hmm. What should I do? What do you mean, what should you do? 
you're asking me what you should do? And then when you surface with all these problems, I'll tell you what you did. You listened to the other voice, and you didn't listen to God's word, and that's why you asked me, what should I do? And I would say to you, go back and do the word. That's what you should have done to begin with. Action required. Action required in overcoming. Action required in overcoming. Engage. You don't have to be a victim of the devil. You don't have to be a victim of nothing. You were called to be the head, not the tail. So quit, you know, what the tail is is what the stinky part is. So what do you want to hang out there for? Well, I'm just part of a tail assembly. What church you go to, the tail assembly? 